Oh, I'm going to take you on a cruise until we find the penguin, penguin. Hello and welcome to Crackcast number 313. This is Ozone Ocean and with me is Dr. Baines. Hello, Dr. Baines. Hello. And with me also is Professor Tansarine. Hello, Professor. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> and we're going to be talking about more stuff on tips and tricks and happy little trees and clever brushes and all those sort of things, you know, to <laughs> techniques and, and drawing um, tips to make your artwork look fantastic, whether it's uh, pen and ink or digital or whatever you choose. But before we get into that, we've got to get into the uh, normal stuff we have, which is a featured uh, comic, which Kwai Degakuse will read out for us today. And Kwai's comic, her featured comic, was Sedna. Sedna. So take it away, Kwai, with Sedna. (laughs) <laughs> Hello, this is Kwai Degakuse, and the feature I've selected for this week is Sedna by Thomas McDonnell, and it is rated E for everyone. Were you ever excited to go on field trips to the planetarium or natural history museum when you were a kid? If the answer is yes, then you may get a kick out of Sedna, a comic about two brainiac youngsters that like to make science references to space astronomy, dinosaurs, chemistry, and geology. Sedna is a very smart girl who is constantly seen with her enormous telescope. Dini is her best friend and frequent play buddy, and the two are always seen making references to science. This comic is adorable, but most importantly, it is educational, and you might learn a thing or two about Saturn's satellites by reading the archive. The art is drawn digitally and makes use of a monochromatic color scheme for each individual page. The art style has very clean lines. Bring out your inner science nerd and read Sedna by Thomas McDonnell. Galileo would be proud. And that was the uh, quiz discussion of Sedna, which is an interesting looking comic from the thumbnail at least. Um, it, it looks fantastic from what I've seen with all sorts of blues and blacks and stuff like that. I like the artwork. Very digital. Digital looking like vector artwork. Okay, so next up we have the music by Mr. Gum Wallace and he has given us the theme to The Fading World or it's just called Fading World actually. It's it's a sort of a fantasy comic about these dark elves or elves of some sort in this uh, medieval oh. um, twilight sort of uh, place, and I think there might be orcs or something or, or some kind of magical foe. And anyway, I featured it last year or the year before, and it's still going strong, which is great. So this music, I would describe it as. It's an oriental procession into a snowy twilight exotic world, unbalanced and dangerous. So, take it away, Mr. Gamalas. <laughs>
And that was the music by Gun Wallace. Lovely little track. I hope you guys will all go and listen to the Quackcast and enjoy it because it's it's very cool. All right, tips and tricks. Baines, what what are you what were you holding out on us last week? About? Wait, did you say go and listen to the Quackcast? Yeah, yeah. That definitely. broke my brain because <laughs> someone heard you heard you say that. <laughs> Go yeah, and listen. You are. That's like not... a, a paradox creating uh, disaster. <laughs> yeah, well. You broke the space and time continuum. As long as you don't kill <laughs> I hope your grandfather. You will listen to this quackcast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's how you become your own grandfather. You have to be careful. <laughs> 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 Uh, well, yeah, last week we t- kind of talked about, or what I thought mattered a lot, was not allowing the eye to get tired or bored. So avoiding those walls of text, not having the text all kind of in a vertical line across various panels. Um, ditto with characters, like sort of allowing the eye to move around somewhat, you know, having a, an appropriate variety of shots, using black, like understanding that dark colors will draw the eye across. And I had some other thoughts, but I don't even remember what they are now. I have to go back and listen. All right. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's think about... Like when, when I... Oh, okay, sorry, go. I was just going to say, let's think no, about I... in terms of simple technical things, like what's the best way to draw a beard, for example? <laughs> uh, well, first you have to meet her and convince her. Oh, stop it. <laughs> but... Uh... <laughs> Tips for gay men here. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, we were talking about <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, about minimizing the uh, really good advice from last week was to minimize the amount of lines on a on say a face. You know, not putting too much detail on on things that don't matter. Like you, you had a lot of good things to say about backgrounds and keeping those. You know, yeah, keep the backgrounds to a minimum. Simple. Because it's... Uh, oh, the brick technique. That was what I talked about. Like drawing a brick wall, you just draw a couple of bricks. Yep. Mm-hmm. Here, a couple of bricks there, and it actually looks better, usually. And yeah, a cu- couple of leaves there, a couple of leaves here. Same, it applies to everything. Fields, you only do a few of the grains of stalks of like uh, corn or hay or whatever, uh, wheat in a field. You don't do every single one. And right. The brain will just fill it in, fill in the blanks. And yeah, also, you know, with a beard or a hair, you don't do every strand of hair, as you yeah. said last time. You sort of exactly. let the let the person's mind fill in the blanks. <laughs> fill in the beard, precisely. <laughs> <laughs> and now everyone realizes why I was not here last uh, podcast because I absolutely, probably, don't do half of these things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but because, um, well, okay. That's not actually too accurate, but um, I think that there is a place in time for super detail, even in backgrounds, and and uh, of course the norm is what you guys said. But okay, in in um, in my comic, I I do a, not always, but when I need establishing shots or when I want to. Um, to really make an imposing panel, I will, I will probably do a very highly detailed background. Like uh, I will go into the buildings and I will do all the small uh, leaves and sculptures that that are in the building. Um, mm. I will uh, draw the the slabs on the pathways and you know. This thing, this sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so I will do that. What I will be careful, though, while I am doing it, is to use different uh, different thickness in the line work. Like the ones that I don't want to super stand out, like uh, the small, very minute details, I will make with very thin um, thickness of the line. And... Uh, I will make a, a, a stronger value, let's say, of line work 
in the things that I want to be standing out or in the foreground. Yeah, yeah. So, but, yeah. Uh, but I think that uh, if you do a very detailed, uh, highly impressive, quote-unquote, background establishing shot, then you can get away with minimalizing everything else in all the other partners. Like, uh, you don't need to yeah. do it all the time. Because then the, the mind does have the image that you want it to have from that establishing shot. So... Yes. Yeah, that's a good sure. point. That's a good point. Then you can um, you can relax a bit, and or just blur out things, or have talking heads almost, as long as you have established the environment in the person's head where everything is happening. Then you're. Really I mean, that gives you a real like sense of place and where yeah. you are. Like, it's not an argument for doing basic like a house or like a window is just four lines with a cross in it or. Everything is super simple. It's not about that because, like, when you do have detail, that really gives you a strong sense of where you are as a reader, like sense of place and texture and kind of atmosphere and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and then once it's established, I'm just repeating what you said. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. And um, the other thing um, I want to add about uh, you are very right about the lines, in my opinion, at least. Um, about the lines in the face, I keep them minimal, and I usually do more shading when I want to show, you know, creases in the face, or especially my faces have to be sunken in a lot because people don't eat very well. So, uh, you know, the lines under the eyes, or you know, where you see the socket of the skull, basically, and um, uh, sunken in. Um, Cheekbones. Uh, cheek yes, and cheekbones and everything. Uh, I don't do those. Uh, those I do with shading. Yeah. Of, uh, oh, okay. I do the right color right. work. But you're still, but you're still pretty good at doing lines on faces. Lines See, when I, I do lines on faces on ages of characters too much, 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 and they look a bit um, uh, crap. But you are very good at using lines on people's faces and not getting that effect. You You... Often put like the lines on the sides of the mouth and the nose and stuff like that. I don't do that because I just can't ever. Make yeah, the, the, the secret I think in that because I used I used to have really old looking people <laughs> in the beginning. Um, is that I don't actually do the entire line. I just start it just a little bit to show the the slope and how. It is going to basically project itself without actually doing it, and then I let I leave the shading to do the rest. So okay. I will have the lines uh, down the nostrils, especially when the character is tired or very emotionally strained, or you know things like that. But if you notice that it will go, not go further than where the nostrils are, yeah. or even be halfway to where the nostrils are. So, and the only reason for that is because I want to imply how much the the, the face is, grim is grimacing, basically, um, yeah. rather than actually an age, an age line. Um, there is one uh, case where I use uh, lines very heavily, and I don't know how it gets across. I think it uh, does have the aging effect, but that's okay, because I have uh, Alex, whom of course we haven't seen like in a year, because the, her scene hasn't come up yet, um, but she's like this very, very emaciated young little girl that she she's like the thinnest of my cast, and she's so thin that actually she has age lines on her face, because... Yeah. Um, if you see a person that is actually starving, you will see that they, no matter how old they are, they do look like an old mm -hmm. person. So that's the only time where I have used age lines for a young face. And I do think it uh, puts people off a little bit, but I have still done it for that purpose. That's pr Yeah, that's probably the, a good thing though, right? Like. You don't want it to be appealing looking. You don't want it to look like, you know, she's a good kind of thin. 
she's yeah. like, <laughs> if you will. <laughs> the supermodel. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, what what about your techniques for scars? Because you do a lot of scars on, well, especially Basil, he has his face scars. Yeah. How do you do your scars? Basil has his face scars. They, they symbolize his distrust in the system, Um, How do it? I actually draw out in ink, proper, like, like when I'm inking, I draw out the, the contour of the scar in very light um, uh, line work and then I color it in with like two or three shades darker than his skin tone okay. and that's how that's how I do it and then it follows the shading of the face yeah. so alright yeah yeah so then yeah. it's not totally um, like a, a line painted on like a Arnold Schwarzenegger in Commando <laughs> of Predator it's no <laughs> part of the face. No, because the idea is like it's a scar. It's a, it's relatively fresh a scar. Like he's had it only for uh, a year or so. So yeah, it's still raw in the sense. Yeah, yeah. What about your technique? I'll is... oh, go on. Tell us. Uh, go yeah, on. the potty scar that he's going to have now when the bandages come off and everything, they're going to be super raw. So it's going to be pinkish. Almost. Yeah, the so way you that follow I'm... reality with the way that you depict scars, you know, like actual people's scars. Yes. Yeah. So you'd you'd advise people who are doing those to sort of look at um like photos and to get the real kind of effect. Yeah, that's what I did, but also I wanted to have this effect. In, uh, like I wanted them to be so realistic because, as I said, they do have uh, like a a symbolic role in, yeah. in the story. Uh, like the, the more that, um, for example, a character will be okay with what happened in the past, the less the scar will be prominent. Oh, okay. So oh. they're not completely disappear, but because that doesn't happen <laughs> unless you get plastic surgery. <laughs> but uh, it's not going to be as as prominent. Yeah. So yeah. Um. I was just thinking, what about wounds and things like that? See, in, I think, Pinky TA, I've got um, one specific instance where she gets her... I'm just trying to find my page so I can find out what I'm talking about. So, oh, the legs, eh? Where you yeah. get your legs. So I, the way I did that, yeah, drawing I did that. horrible, ragged wounds, was I didn't actually draw that in. I just, I think I just painted that in completely, and that was the way I, I approached it. And so, yeah. The, so the way I showed that, like wounded flesh, was to um, draw the pink bent skin of the normal unwounded leg, and then I did the edges of the wound in black, solid black, and I, I actually coloured the whole wound in in black, and then did the mm -hmm. highlights of the wound in red blood. So that way you've got a bit of depth for for the wound without actually having to show you know torn muscle tissue or anything like that so it could be safe and still gory you know because there's blood and there's blackness but it's very easy to do that you could achieve a lot of uh, realistic you know affecting gore just by doing like with the red red and with the black underneath so I found that yes. a really easy technique yeah How do I you also Good. Yeah, I also paint in the the wounds. And the worst the worst wounding I have ever painted is it, it's like in the first first uh, chapter, let's say of the of the story, where, where you have this guy that has just been interrogated and is uh, is being executed on the street, and he has he has this uh, like half his face is super swollen, you know, broken facial bones and stuff, you know, oozing out there, really disgusting stuff. So um, what I did was, I, again, I also drew the face properly as if he was pristine and proper, yeah. um, and colored it improperly and everything. And then I started the, uh, dismantling his face, basically, by painting over it. Um, <laughs> And uh, I also, 
I have to say that if you want to draw a realistic wound, go and Google search that thing. Oh, God, no. <laughs> and and have, the guts, have the guts to look at it and, yeah. and see how it looks like in real life. And, and then... Have the guts when to you look have at guts. Your, yeah. I'm sorry. Exactly. And when you have saturated yourself with this image and you can almost smell it and shut oh, it off or, and, and oh. go in the draw and go and draw and it will come out in the impression that will best be for your style. I think. <laughs> that, that's how I do it. Like, I, I actually went and and uh, I remember Googling all these images of, of beaten up people with broken faces basically from extreme battery. And uh, and, and then uh, for forties I also I went and saw people's bags that were whipped and everything. Oh, God. how it looked like it, it's terrible <laughs> but um, yeah the idea that then the method is that you draw the, the body as it should be and then you start actually inflicting the wound basically and and, and uh, I do that by drawing in in, uh, in an overlay like I have an, an extra layer that is an overlay and usually multiply yeah. Uh, mode, and um, uh, because that will also imitate the shading, and then I can see how I will tweak it differently. Um, and I draw in uh, dark red, and the more the blood, the darker it is. So where it is deepest, it's going to be blacker. Okay. Let's say, and um, um, the more the bruising. Again, the darker it is, but the palette is is purple and not black, and not red. Yeah. Um, so you have a super dark purple that you use, um, and then uh, the wound is not just like uh, an epithet on the place where it is. It affects the entire limb or body part. So you have to to account for that. It has to, you have to have some light bruising the farthest away from the wound and then it has to be gradually more and more terrible as it goes to uh, the actual site yeah. and unless it is a gunshot that has just been inflicted so there's yeah. that <laughs> um, yeah but uh, the palette is uh, the reds from black to uh, black red to crimson and and uh, also not be afraid to use uh, hot saturated red for the top for the highlights yes exactly yeah, yeah. it depends on what kind of wound it is as well so um yeah yes, bruising but... wounds burning yeah slicing all that kind of stuff <laughs> it's gross <Yeah. laughs> uh, but it's important to but get you have to look at the original. you have to look at actual <laughs> Otherwise, it will look like ketchup. <laughs> oh, it depends on how <laughs> yeah. you want it to look, though. Maybe you want yes, it to look course. fake. <laughs> oh. um, yeah, so that that's another thing, like special effects. So blood, uh, broken glass, fire, smoke. Snow. How... Snow, yeah, snow is a, a big one. Um how do you guys get snow? I mean, not just snow on the ground, but snow in the air. Do you have yeah. a special brush for that? Or um, no, I'm very, I'm um, a very crude, uh, non-developed person in terms of brushes. I I only use your standard uh, hard circular brush or your soft circular brush. That's it. I don't really use uh, the other brushes. So, because I don't know how, that's the only reason why. It's not like I'm snobbing. I just don't know <laughs> how to use it. <laughs> um, so, uh, what I do for snow is that I never paint white, ever. Oh, okay. Um, I Tell paint me. a very, very, very light blue. Like, uh, it's... Um, it's uh, so light blue that that it looks white on the panel. 
Although, if you see in the little selection of, uh, you know, when you select the, the color, yeah, it will look blue. But on the on the panel, it will look white. All right. Yeah. Especially snow is a lot in grain resistance. So, if you see that um, the the white test of white, like super pure white, I only use for mountain tops where the light hits directly and only only on the very top. Everything else is several different shades of very light blue. Yeah. And for my shadows, for my shadows, I use I use a, a, a darker blue, which I you we shouldn't be at least I realized that you shouldn't be afraid to actually have dark colors like dark grays, blue grays. Um, to be the shade and the, and the shadows of the snow yeah. because snow is a reflective surface basically so where there is a shadow you will have grays like a mirror so to, so to speak so you will have grays, you will have blues uh, depending on where the snow is uh, assuming that we are talking about snow that hasn't been trampled on and it's, it's pure right? yeah, yeah. fresh Snow, and it's not yellow. Right? So, <laughs> That's the kind you should so, be eating, not walking on. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, so, <laughs> so yeah. Um, when the snow falls, it depends again. Is it a blizzard? Is it a free falling snow like in Christmas cards, or um, that falls very lightly and happily and everything? Yeah. And what I do with that is that I take like a thick brush, a thick uh, version, like a 20 pixels wide or something, and and I make random little um, flicks of white across the panel, and then I I have um, a le- um, a filter over it that uh, in Photoshop is I think it's uh, the maximum filter it's called okay. and that will okay. diminish that will diminish for a few pixels the 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 edges of the of the flick but in ways that make it a little bit random so it looks very natural and you have like this thick rich snow that is falling down All right. Um, All so right. that's how I do it Oh, that's interesting because um, well, I've only got one really snowy panel or how it works. Yeah, I've only got done that once and um, my way of doing it was to make uh, the distant, well, I was thinking about it from the point of view of like if you had, um, had like your eye focus or a camera or whatever, uh, snowflakes that were that you weren't focusing on would be blurry and ones that were like you know too close would be blurry ones too far away and you'd only focus on the middle distant ones so mm-hmm. so those ones are like oh well, that's circles. a very neat with, so, yeah with, the and then yeah. the other ones yeah. are sort of see-through circles or you know blurred out mm-hmm. so that means you have a bit of depth exactly yeah, yeah. yeah. what about um smoke uh, what about rain Oh, right. yeah. oh, and one more thing just to add about the snow thing. Snow is heavy. So when you, you know, paint uh, in snow that has, you know, layered up on uh, on the surface, you have to have in mind that it has weight. So yeah. it will weight on, on, on a tree, for example, or something that is uh, like a bendy surface and it is snowed in, it will be interacting with the snow's weight. That's all. I'm done. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You're gonna bend it in. Yeah. So, Baines, you mentioned rain. Uh, like rain and water. I've never attempted. Well, water. Water is completely different depending on what subject. you're doing with. Yeah. yeah. It's as big yeah. as the ocean. But, <laughs> um, mm. but rain. <laughs> rain is is a, a, a specific trial in itself. I have never tried rain ever. Not yet. Mm. I I don't believe I've ever um, tried rain. No, me neither. I don't think I have either. <laughs> I've ever drawn it. <laughs> but the way I would approach it, though, 
is I would imply it more than draw it in, in the sense that I would make sure that the characters are very wet and that there are some, uh, you know, droplets bouncing off surfaces like umbrellas or things like that. Yeah. And maybe, like, have one or two diagonal lines, very random, and not more than one or two imply that it's raining. That's how I would do Okay, that yeah, makes sense, yeah. Yes, you know. Afraid of it, then. <laughs> That's how I do it. It's kind of how rain shows up on film, which it really doesn't. But you just put those couple lines to imply it and then kind of show the water, where the water's bouncing and where it's dripping down a character's, you know, uh, face or, or well, whatever. Now I want to draw a scene with rain. You, I can't because it's yeah. so snowy. Bastards. No. What about, uh, like, smoke and fire? Oh, smoke, huh. is, smoke is fun. There's so many ways to do smoke, isn't there? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it depends on uh, where, where, what is, is the fire making it? it is it uh, this big fire that is yeah, almost like a, a force of nature in itself, or is it a cigarette? I like cigarette smoking because the cigarette smoke be is, very it's typically blue and it has swirls, which is uh, an interesting yes. thing to draw. So you can be a very artistic. And, and and it, it can also show past movement of the, of the hand if oh, a cat is gesticulating with a, with a yes, it, it traces the movement so to speak so, so it's you fun can, you can illustrate smoke from a cigarette as like two lines that's the simplest way you could do it it doesn't even have to be yes. painted it's just yeah, two lines twisting or one line if you want one line. even one line, yeah, yeah. yes I the way I like to try and do it is with two light two colored lines like blue lines and twist them and do a sort of a faded blue in between them and sometimes that works yeah. and sometimes it doesn't <laughs> to sort of depict the, the, the thing f- with uh, cigarettes and uh, this is not from the expert the person that smoke and um, is that uh, cigarettes don't actually emit that level of smoke all the time. Like uh, when yeah. you are talking, like I am right now, it actually will not make any kind of, of smoke. Uh, the smoke is made when you take a drag out of the of the cigarette uh, for a little while, like for a second or two. That's when the smoke is made uh, from the edge of the cigarette. So. If you have a character that is talking a lot and hasn't taken a drug for a while in your panels, you are safe just not drawing in the smoke at all. Yes. Um, yes. It's realistic. Because if it was smoking like that, the guy would be left without a cigarette in like <laughs> two panels or something. Um, <laughs> it's not a good quality cigarette if it smokes that much all the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I've got for uh, what was That's it? Um, for, uh, what Polly in Bottomless Waitress. She's Polly smoking a lot. Waitress. She's smoking a lot. Right. And her cigarette's constantly emitting great plumes of. <laughs> <laughs> well, either she is like a nervous smoking the thing without giving it a chance. Uh, so then, yes. Or she should change brands. <laughs> They're probably very cheap cigarettes. Yeah, <laughs> yes. that's your problem. <laughs> Most likely, she she uh, buys the bag of um, tobacco and rolls them oh, herself. Gross, probably. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, let's see. Well, no, that, all... Those are even those are even uh, harder to actually get them to smoke like that because they have they are all ups and uh, the smoke the tobacco in it is uh, pure. So all right. That's even worse. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, man. She's highly skilled. <laughs> highly skilled. She's very good at blowing. Very, very. <laughs> <laughs> That's how she gets the boyfriends. Um, but how uh, dare you uh, talk about party? <laughs> <laughs> there's there's different kinds of smoke, as you said, like from fires. Um, and one thing I do a lot is uh, the smoke from explosions and rockets and things mm-hmm. like that. And yeah. So, a rocket motor produces like a continuous like mechanical puffs of smoke it won't like 
in one stream it'll if you look at a, a rocket trail it's sort of like rhythmic kind of puffs and things like that yeah um, that and they expand the further away they get from the rocket motor so the closest they are to the rocket motor they are a lot um uh well, they're, they're quite solid and usually white or something. It depends on the rocket fuel, obviously. But the further away the, they get from the rocket, they expand and they get more transparent and then they disappear. So that's the thing you've got to realise when you're doing that kind of uh, smoke. And then you've sort of got to think about, you know, what what's my rocket powered by? You know, if it's a, mm. if it's a rocket ship, it's going to be hydrogen, oxygen. So it's going to be white. It's going to be water. But, you know, if it's a a rocket for a, a like a missile or something like that and it's going to be something dirtier because it's uh you know it's it's a different mm-hmm. kind of thing so darker smoke maybe or blue smoke or, or something like that but um the way i draw it is with a bunch of like really dirty brushes so um what i mean is they the kind of they're not like the hard round or the soft round like you'd normally use these have sort of got very rough edges so you can just sort of roughly sketch in your shapes and normally go with like the like uh if like i was saying like they produce puffs of smoke so if it's a rocket coming towards you or something like that then you could do the overlaying puffs of smoke so you start off by doing like a dark circle and then a white whitish and sort of grayish in the middle of that so you've got a bit of three dimensionality so what's closer to you is like uh, more highlighted and what's further away is is darker because that's um, mm-hmm. that sort of works with the, the smoke it kind of looks more fresh that way and then you do another one over the top of that and over the top of that and over the top of that and then you've got a long like trail and so that's the way to do that so that's mm-hmm. simple smoke that's awesome a rocket motor that's really good yeah. uh, when you have a uh, smoke from a fire that is burning wood or that is burning material like uh, not like a mechanical combustion but when you have um, a tree burning for example yeah. or or a village burning <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, then the, the smoke is going to be black um, black in the impression that it's going to give the viewer but I am against drawing in pure white or pure black because it doesn't give you a lot of leeway when yeah, you have color. Hard, isn't it? So yes. <laughs> uh, but I usually choose a very dark brown um, to make smoke like this. And and it it also is like a massive like it's it has body. It's not wisps over there. So you have the core of the of the smoke that's coming from the source and and that will be the darkest. And then if you have plumes like sort of billowing out outwards, uh, in the general direction of the entire pillar of smoke and where it's going. And and that you have to consider whether there is wind in general or not. If it's if there is no wind it's going to go straight up. If there is even a little bit of wind wind is going to go you know towards the direction of where it is it's blowing so yeah. you I first trace the direction of the general pillar in that dark color and then I start sort of um, making the billows in circular in circular ways in circular movements in general and uh, when I have the this skeleton quote unquote of the of the smoke then I get lighter and lighter and lighter and, and as I get outwards it will get lighter until it's just with wisps of smoke stays with wisps of yeah. smoke that have you know, uh, escaped out. in the sand yes but it will be like billowing and be strong and everything um, yeah. if it's massive if the source is, is massive of course <laughs> yes yeah it, it, Indicates the uh, the size of the uh, conflagration. <laughs> what about exactly, excellent word. Fire as well. See, the way I do fire is again, I use sort of 
dirty brushes, but it, it doesn't matter. You can you can use you can do fire with any kind of brush, but a dirty brush sort of makes it a lot easier to do the ragged kind of shape of fire. But my technique is to do like black behind the fire, or at least some kind of um, dark dark tone, and then over the top of that, then I do the red, then I do the and the red sort of indicates the shape of the fire. Then over the mm -hmm. top of that, I'll do the orange. The orange indicates the shape of the fire even more, so I'll do those lines a bit more, a bit less fuzzy. And then over the top of that will be yellow and sort of very whitish yellow. And those were will be like the heart of the fire. And because mm -hmm. of the, they've got the dark background to be against, they are absolutely highlight and they look really bright and burny and hot. So yeah, that's me too. A very that's how I do. Yeah, it's that's great. So fire is. I I also like to use blend for like a, a blending tool. Okay. I like to use the blending tool for that, especially in the core of the in the core of the fire, where the white gives into the orange. I like yeah. to blend it a little bit so that it feels that it is sort of losing in temperature as it oh, goes out. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good yeah so you haven't got like um distinct separations between the the yellow and the whitish colors and the the red and the orange so it also could it kind of blends into each other and softens mm -hmm. out yeah that's a good idea um for things like uh i'm just looking at some of my pages here to get inspiration for this but uh so i've got an explosion so of course you've got fire and smoke and there's a lot of different ways you can do explosions in, in Hollywood they always show the, the cinematic fireball but in reality you almost never see fireball explosions mm -hmm. what you see is um, real explosions tend to be like a lot of black smoke with a little bit of fire in the middle and I I've tried that myself and to do that I used a lot of black or you know really really dark dark reddish or whatever and sort of over like um how do we explain it okay like i do a kind of black shell of the explosion the outline of the explosion where we you know we have kind of shapes like shooting out and showing debris firing off and that's all in kind of black and then over the top of that i'll go like with um well inside of that like in a sh in like an onion I'll do like mm -hmm. a, a red kind of outline in over there, over the edge of that, inside of that. Then over the top of that, I'll do another black outline, but going slightly inwards always, you know, like a babush, a babush guitar. <laughs> in again, another black outline, which sort of goes over the top of that orange outline from the last uh, thing, but leaves some of it peeping through. And then I'll just keep on doing that until I can get, get to the centre, you know, where there is the white heart of the explosion. So that sort of gives you the yeah. effect of uh, redness peeping through. You know, it's it's like lava when you see it peeping through basalt. It looks really hot and um, uh, yeah. demonic because you have that blackness sort of uh, hiding it. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's, uh, it reminds me. Okay. How do you do gold? Oh, gold. I, yeah, I talked to this to Baines last week. It's really simple, actually. But I can never remember to do it unless I actually look at how I've done it before. <laughs> <laughs> so. uh, I don't remember it completely. The, the, the two things that I do remember, because I also look it up before I do it, <laughs> um, is that you have to use uh, black, like or super dark, Okay. For some uh, of the corners of you know the metal and and uh, two or three different uh, shades of yellow orange sort of thing. Yeah. Not orange exactly, but it's uh, like two orange orange. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways of doing it. it. Depends on what kind of goldy color you want. Whether you want more brassy or you know old gold greeny color or whatever. But mm -hmm. yeah, there's there's a lot of different ways of doing it. Um, I would never use black myself. I just use really dark uh, umber or for the dark tone. But yeah, um, the easiest way to do it is say you've got 
like some item is, is going to be gold. So you just do it all in, in ochre, which is the mid-tone. Then you have like an area on the top part where it's going to be really light yellow, but mm -hmm. that's in, in some kind of like a very small area. It's going to be, say a circle is going to be really light yellow. Then you'll have um, a very, very small separation of that, which is going to be white or close to white and bordering that directly you'll have the darkest tone that you're going to have so your dark umber which really highlights the white mm -hmm. and below that you'll have it just sort of kind of fading out with um a kind of orange or something like this and mm -hmm. that sort of gives you the the effect and it, it works every time you just use those kind of colors as long as you yeah, use yeah, them yeah. in the right order it works and you know you can create all sorts of uh different gold effects using those but it takes experimentation to know how to get it right but normally the simplest is you know your ochre mid tones and then going over that with just um just having your your umber and your um your whitey yellow and having them next to each other as long as that's somewhere in there that's your uh, strong reflection so that works but don't ask me how to do chrome because that's another kettle of fish all <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, chrome is yeah, super hard. Oh, fur, that's another good one. Oh, my God, I got really good at doing fur at one stage. Have you guys done fur? Yes. Um, little bit, not much. So how do you... Yeah, I have done fur. Depends on the fur. What animal is it? Is it from? Because it it will behave differently. Um, the easiest type of fur is the fur that is usually used for, you know, the expensive uh, fur coats and stuff. With, because it basically acts like hair, yeah. more or less, short hair. So you, if you if you sketch it like this, you, I think you are going to be on the safe side. Like have a Little little ruffles where the creases are, where you have, like, um, for example, on a sleeve, where you have the the edge of the sleeve, and where you have the shoulder, you can make little um, hair-like, short hair-like um, edges, so to speak, and and then when you color it. Just remember that you are coloring basically hair, and and that should be fine. But yeah. um, for example, uh, in in Baby Resistance, Sakis is wearing this this uh, vest that he has out of goat oh, hair, yeah. which which is terrible to <laughs> actually <laughs> say. And the reason for that is that goat hair, if you have ever seen does not behave as a normal fur. It's like clumps, clumps of hair all over the place, but somehow it is still a fur. <laughs> so you have to have clumpy, clumpy hair uh, dropping all around his his vest, like in, in layers, because you. it also depends on how the coat is made. And, and, and his coat is made in sort of layers and layers of skin, of, of gold skin with the hair in it. So, okay. um, so what I do for that is I start working from the bottom up because the topmost layer is the one that is going to show the most, yeah. like the full clump of hair. And and um, then so you, I start working from uh, from his uh, lower layers and work making clumps of hair um, and and then they will be covered by the other clumps of hair and that might seem very fussy but that's the only way I have seen of making this effect of having of having this um, goat skin fur yeah. that still looks like goat and not for example fox or something like that <laughs> and, and you also have to think that the, the goats are never uniformly colored for some reason. So 
it's not going to be you, do, you won't have like a grey gold fur vest it's going to have orange, it's going to have black it's going to have white and brown and grey and, and it's going to be random and terrible so you have to keep <laughs> interchanging interchanging these colors um, uh, like the cloud itself might have two colors so you have to decide like okay I will have the most colored uh, skins below or above or whatever and then you know work, work in this fashion you have to keep in some furs you have to keep the animal in your mind as you make a fur yeah. um, and, and decide on the method because if it is a very unruly sort of hair it will show no matter how well it is pieced together and you have to, to represent this um, yeah that's my experience on this that's very complicated that's very complicated I hate his. I hate his his jacket. I hate it. (laughs) 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 What about you, Bain? How do you approach that? Well, I put some shaving cream on first, (laughs) (laughs) and then uh, no, no. I start with scissors, and then I. You mix up and the wax the, and uh, make it exactly, off. Exactly. Uh, yank it off. Press it on and you know, clench my... I put a little bar in my teeth and clench it. And then <laughs> yank it off. That's how you have the smoothest buttocks, this side of uh, the Yukon. Absolutely. It's complicated, too, in a different way. <laughs> so what, what other elements? This is awesome, by the way. We're just going through the whole, um, you know, a whole a series of... Uh, yeah. Items. Oh, how about that? How do you color eyes? Like the eyes? Yeah, know. the eyes have it. How do you color that? That's all the eyes. Eyes. What is your eye, eye color? Um, well, I've just been kind of working on that recently, really. I mean, I've sort of been doing gigantic eyes with, like, kind of dots in them and occasionally a little highlight. Now I'm kind of working on... Um, doing it a little better and making them look a little less vacant. Uh, I've done some, uh, you know, looked at some uh, YouTube, like some tutorials and stuff like that. And it talks about kind of shading the upper part of the eye under the eyelid. So the iris and the pupil are not kind of separated from everything else, which that get, can give characters kind of a stoned kind of like a drugged out <laughs> kind of look. Yeah. So to sort of shade underneath um, kind of choose your details, you know, like a lot of people know this already, like instead of drawing individual eyelashes, again, the principle of sort of simplifying things, you kind of would draw three kind of clumps, two or three kind of clumps, I guess, for a, you know, a female's eyelashes. Um, and then, um, yeah, just looking at your highlights, like um, Ozan Ocean talks about well, not just him, but, you know, we talk about light sources and all that kind of stuff. So you have your little highlights. Your, as Ozone Ocean said last week, the whole eye is reflective, so you want your highlights kind of on your uh, pupils and crossing over to the iris. And yeah. Shading, like kind of mm-hmm. right underneath the upper eyelid, putting a little bit of shading up there to it gives them kind of a lifelike kind of appearance. And then, of, of course, like depending how simple or complex your style is, you obviously think about emotion because the eyes are you know so expressive and think about the shape and the emotion you're looking for i like one one eye to be squinting and the other eye bigger it's my favorite <laughs> facial expression mine too yeah or a character looking at in at another character in in a scance or something like that or whatever you know expression you're shooting for <laughs> i have a lot of those uh eye squints that's a, that's a <laughs> technique. I, people I, look I, at me I, that I way all the time, eyes. so yeah. <laughs> I love drawing eyes for for that purpose because if if you get the eyes right enough, I mean, uh, you can get away with not doing the rest of the expression absolutely accurately if uh, if the eyes work. Yeah. That's so it. not that you should, <laughs> but it's you get the pass on the rest. Um, one thing to keep yeah. in mind when you when you're doing eyes, if you're showing a character looking at someone, the eyes do not move in uh, perfect parallel. So 
say if, if you're showing the eyes to the side, the eye that's closest to them will be slightly more to the middle of, you know, the mm -hmm. uh, whatever the eye area, and the eye that's further away will be more towards the corner of the eye because they're, they're going triangulating on a, on a person. They're triangulating on a thing. So that means they'll always, one will always uh, have to travel more than the other, than the one that's closest to the thing. So if you want to draw something looking realistically, uh, you don't show them in the same position each time when the, the person looking sideways at least. Oh, that's very yeah. cool. Yeah. I mean, when you're showing someone looking up, yeah. of course, uh, and down, <laughs> they do. <laughs> Go on, Tans. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have. I also have like I have a few rules for the eyes that I I use on all my characters. Um, the first thing is that unless they are absolutely very startled, like super surprised, though, not just a bit surprised, <laughs> or extremely stoned, <laughs> or extremely. Uh, extremely frightened. Yeah, worried. Uh, the, the, the yes, uh, not worried, frightened. Like, <gasps> oh my god, it's the dinosaur is going to eat me. Sort of thing. <laughs> um, uh, if, uh, if 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 they are in this situation, then and only then, the pupils are not going to touch on any side of the of the eyelid upper or lower. They're going to be completely, not only the pupils, uh, the iris. Well. Yeah. They, they, they are going to be not necessarily in the center of the, of the eyes. That depends on, you know, the angle and where they're looking at and everything. But the, the, they are not, the eye is not going to sort of, it's not going to touch at all on any of the corners. Otherwise, yeah. I, I prefer to draw sort of uh, half domes and the pupil is going to touch either at the upper or at the lower eyelid um, yeah, good which point. I think uh, gives, it gives depth it gives depth of uh, and, and, and more power at uh, the glance whosever glance it is, it doesn't matter um, okay. and it, it looks a little bit more alive I think as well yeah. Um, yeah. The the other thing that I do is, and this is a little bit of a cheat, I think, that uh, when the person is very emotional or is a good person, <laughs> uh, the pupil is a bit wider in relation to the iris than that of an evil person. It will have uh, the the evil person will have a bit uh, narrower. Pinprick. Uh, pupils, not eyes. Yeah, and not pinprick because pinprick is is too much of a tell. But um, <laughs> it's going to be a little, a little bit narrower, um, unless they are extremely cool. bad or extremely cool. emotional. Um, because then, if you do that, it detracts from the emotion, and you don't want that. Um, and the third thing that I always do is that. Uh, they, they are always like the the color is never solid. It it has a highlight and a darker part, depending on on where the the light source is. Yeah. You will, I will always yeah. have um, like the, some part is going to be lighter and and the exact opposite part, like di on the other side of the of the diameter. Okay, it's going to be darker. And that, uh, I think, also adds more liveliness. Like it's a, it's a living eye, so it does have, it, it, it does have always, you know, lighting. And it, since it is a sphere, it will have this uh, difference in coloring. And the more you want to to make the 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 glance be alive and intense, the the more contrast you will give. Uh, I have done this a lot with with Bazi and with Hunter. Hunter's eyes that are almost yellowish. They are brown basically, but they they do have a lot of amber slash yellow uh, tones in in it because they are light brown. Um, and I think that gives him a bit more of a feral <laughs> Hunterish <laughs> um, look. 
when he's angry especially. Um, so yeah, I do play with the color a lot to give these feels in the eyes. And what about say um, when someone has about, say, um, red um, eyes? Um, now this is um, red eyes. Um, uh, if you have red eyes as a person, uh, if, you, if you look at what causes them being red, it's just uh, the, like the albino. No, no, no. I mean the white part, the sclera, the white part of the eye goes goes red. So you oh. have sort of a oh, like bloodshot but, eyes. Yeah, bloodshot yeah. eyes. Okay, and. But if yeah. if you're like from a distance, the, the whole eye looks pink. But close up, that's made by the eye is still as white as it always was. It's just the uh, the little red vessels mm-hmm. are redder <laughs> than normal. Um, so I've I've tried, you know, drawing those in as red vessels, and it never it always makes a person look crazy or insane. So for me, <laughs> you've yeah. got to just do it pink, and then just. Just do hmm. deal with it. I I usually uh, color it sort of like a, I use it as a shading mechanism more, and um, at the edges, uh, and that maybe I have benefited because I get bloodshot eyes yeah. easy for some reason um, when I have headaches and everything. So at the edges of the eyes, on the outer side, outer edge, and on the inner edge, that's where I will draw the red, and the red is going to start being pink towards the where well, you are towards the eyes. It's going to be pink, and it's going to become redder and redder as we approach and the edge. The, or the, the edges, edge. yeah, yeah, just a little bit, yeah. And I will also make a very very thin line, very thin line, uh, tracing the edges of the eye. So a very thin red line tracing the edges of the eye and, and that gives the impression of it being bloodshot while still having white in it. at least it had worked in my case so yeah. like having a little bit of a trace at the edges because basically if you think about it it's the it's the inflammation of the tissue there so if you just inflame the tissue <laughs> it will show yeah. rather than make the the, 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 the little Vessels. <laughs> Capillaries or whatever they're called. Yes, yes Caterpillars. Exactly. Yeah. Caterpillars <laughs> in your eyes, yeah, they'll give you red eyes. Yeah. <laughs> they'll yeah. give you perfectly red eyes. Just fill them mm-hmm. up with caterpillars. All right, I'm trying to think of any other little tips. We've almost got, well, we have got to the hour. My God. Okay. <laughs> That's enough tips and tricks for everyone. Just do, you'll have to sort of deal with those ones and the tips we gave you from last week, and then just create your masterpieces out of those, <laughs> like Lego. That, that's the blocks you got. This is make. a good one. I, I kept a list of uh, all the uh, things we covered, so we can like have a list on the description of the Quackcast. Awesome. Really? It's been a pretty uh, useful Quackcast, I would say, for once. So you have yeah. been keeping, keeping a record. Wow. <laughs> I, took the, I took the minutes. That's my job right now. Awesome. Well, I have like, <laughs> uh, the, uh, the Quackcast um, like, written up. You've got to like copy and paste that into there or type that into there. That would be fantastic. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening. And thank you, Tance, Dr. Tance, Dr. Nice Lawyer nice. Tance. Thank you. Dr. Lady Tongue. Lady Dr. Tongue. <laughs> Dr. Lady. <laughs> I'm not a doctor. <laughs> uh, and uh, Admiral Baines, of course. Grazie. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.